to all of you. Dr. Vincent Parr, partner in uh, ANL Good Bodies, who has been uh, educated in every university except, I think, this one. Uh, but is a, a sometime lecturer also in uh, Trinity College and indeed has uh, kindly attended and uh, lectured in my own courses. Um, this will be followed by the two uh, other speakers, first by Kate McKenna and thereby, then by Claire Graydon, who I will introduce at that time. Vincent. Um, bear with me. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Dermot, and thank you for that very kind introduction. Uh, and I will make amends and uh, go to Trinity eventually. Um, ladies and gentlemen, let's start with the scale of this issue. Let's start with the scale of state aid and COVID-19. As of last night, 175,456 people are dead across the European Union, the European Economic Area and the UK because of COVID-19. That's more than Hiroshima, it's more than Nagasaki. And because it's incremental and still growing, we will probably exceed those numbers. And I mention that because that's the scale of the human tragedy, which has meant that an area of law that did not exist four months ago, COVID-19 state aid law has come into existence. And if you think about the progress, if you think about the period between the 12th of March to the 23rd of June last year, you were looking across all of state aid at about 72 decisions by the Commission. This year, you're looking at 280 decisions. Now, that's a huge increase. It's not the case, however, that they are all about uh, COVID-19. If you look at the COVID-19 decisions so far this year, you're looking at about 166 decisions. And the point to bear in mind is that that will not be the totality of the involvement of state aid in COVID-19. There are some matters which have not been notified, which ought to be notified. And there are other matters which do not need to be notified and member states have acted and behaved quite rightly in not notifying them because the commission has been extraordinarily flexible. But we're talking about, if we were medics, we would look at it as an area of science which has been developing over the last seven or eight months. In law, we're looking at an area which has only been in existence for four months. Now, it has touched every member state. If you look at all the state aid decisions involving COVID-19 and the member states, and Ireland is down there just after six o'clock at about 2% of the decisions. We've had four decisions published so far. Now, that table is really, that pie chart doesn't tell you the full story. Look at Germany in there at only 5% of the decisions. We'll come back to it mo in a moment. The key point about all of this is the involvement of Germany uh, and state aid. And I'll t tell you a little bit more about that in a moment. Now, if you think about the Irish decisions, we've had four, 200 million to support the economy, 200 million to support companies affected, 250 million micro and small companies, and 200 million with R&D. So there's been a, a number of Irish decisions, but actually we are in the small beer category compared to the rest. When you think about the banking crisis and you think back in the 2010 bailout and you look at 85 billion, and we look down at the back of the sofa for the 5 million in our cash reserves. And then you look at, for example, just one decision on the 21st of March, which was actually the French decision, the liquidity decision, that was 300 billion. So this is an extraordinary, unprecedented intervention. And the second point I want to convey, the first one was this is enormous. The second one is there is a real risk of undesirable outcomes here. The scale and the breadth of the depth and depth of scale, breadth and depth of the aid are unprecedented. You have people from all over Europe looking for money. State aid is the pinata that everybody has battered and bruised for the last four months. If you look there at the Dutch ice rink, there'll be people in the southern Europe who have been affected and were wondering about the Dutch uh, and the coronavirus bonds. They'll be puzzled because it's just a straightforward state aid decision. Two million euros given to 
an ice rink because of its difficulties. But there is Finnish shipping companies, Lithuanian Forests, Airlines, TAP, uh, SAS, Lufthansa, Air France, and so on. The scale of this is enormous. Now, the interesting thing to look back, if you look at the pattern of the provision of state aid, and in particular, if you look, and this is 2018, it's been the same pattern every year. Every time I write the, an annual state aid review, I'm always amazed. Ireland is always out there as an outlier, giving very little state aid, but Germany is giving a huge amount. And when you look, for example, at the 7th of May uh, state aid board, and you look at who's giving what, and you'll notice that Ireland is down there at the bottom, and Germany is right there at the top. And the same thing is happening now. Today's Financial Times is a very good chart which shows the fiscal response to the pandemic in European countries. Now, Ireland isn't listed there, but we're way down there. Germany is giving an enormous amount of aid. So when you look at the economic damage that will be paid, and state aid is partly designed to prevent that damage occurring, Germany will be the best performing uh, or the least worst performing state uh, in the European Union because the amount of aid is enormous. Uh, and the Cypriot finance minister very early on in June identified this, uh, Petrida, he said, look, of the aid which at that stage been approved, 2.19 trillion, we don't know the total amount because some of the aid is for a up to a billion for certain companies in Germany. Germany had 46%. Lawrence Boone, uh, the chief economist of the OECD, was identified in her submission to the European Parliament that there is going to be a long-term effect of this state aid because it is unequal. Now, I don't need to remind this audience of what is state aid. You know it well. It's an advantage granted by a member state favouring certain undertakings, distorting competition, which can affect trade between member states. Now, if you look at the EU responses overall, and the, the EU, this has been a, a moment, a challenging moment. People talk about the Hamilton moment. That's just one of the moments. This is a really important challenge because the European Union has got to make sure that citizens identify with it and want to stay with it. So the bazooka of the 2.4 trillion recovery plan, the R&D funding, the rescue stockpile and so on, that's all extremely important. But what's very important in this context is how the EU has responded to the state aid. The state aid has been, member states have said we want to give it and the European Commission has asked to approve it. Now the European Commission is in a really difficult position. It cannot say well let's wait for two or three months, let's see what it all looks like and let's do it in a harmonious way. It has responded to those. So when you look at the 166 decisions, 86% uh, of them have been decided by the framework, uh, temporary framework communication which didn't exist before March. Now, if you look, for example, at 9% of them, they are in the aid to make good the damage caused by natural disasters or exceptional occurrences. Now, you know the architecture of 107. Paragraph 2 is aid which is permissible by law if you can satisfy the criteria, and 3 is the discretionary aid. So 9% have fallen within that scope. Uh, the natural disaster is exceptional occurrences one. Uh, again, 5% in the serious disturbance to the economy. There's one decision, it's the TAP Portuguese case, because the airline was already in difficulties as of the 31st of December 2019. So it was then in the 3C category. Um, so it's unlike Air France or Lufthansa or SAS, and the rest have been by the temporary framework. Now, it's impossible in a talk like this with you know, 10, 12, 15 minutes, whatever, to, to go through all the nuances and the niceties and the uh, particularities and the peculiarities, but just to give you a sense of what's in the temporary framework. It's soft law. It's a communication. Now, it was presaged on the 13th of March by communication on the need for a coordinated economic response. That was a useful document because it identified a lot of interventions which states could do where they didn't have to actually uh, notify it to the commission or whatever. The temporary framework came out on the 19th of March, much faster than the framework that was used, for example, in the uh, financial crisis. So a lot has been learned from that. Very quickly, it was amended. The first amendment came about on the 3rd of April, and that basically allowed for various COVID-19 type research, but it also did targeted wage subsidies and so on. It was amended a second time on the 8th of May uh, for recap and debt measures. So 
that you could states could invest in member state companies uh, and then also provide for exit terms and so on, but also governance and ban and cross subsidization. Now, some of this aid, like for example, the Condor aid with Germany, it's aid which is being put in, which will in partly be used to repay other aid. So you have to wonder about the quality of the aid uh, at times. Now, the framework, there are basically 11 types of aid which are permitted and these slides will all be available to you later but that gives you a sense of what's there so there are things like guarantees on loans and so forth investment a lot of COVID-19 stuff a lot of bonuses and rewards if you do it cross-border and so on uh, so a lot of very interesting types of aid and, and remember all of this didn't exist four months ago it's going to be amended again in all probability a third amendment to deal with tech startups uh, and micro companies and small companies have been different and that's currently uh, under consultation. Now we're going to find that it will be amended again, um, that sort of tech area. Um, the consultation has been underway since the 12th of June and in all probability the Commission will uh, amend it again. Now it's again soft law. This is really interesting how you've got your treaty provisions but the Commission is making law not with the Parliament, not with the Council but itself. It did it right throughout the financial crisis and those soft measures, are the financial crisis, are still being measured and used today uh, in this crisis. So in terms of the evolution, we don't know what will come next, but a particular date that's mentioned quite a bit in these documents is the 31st of December, 2020. Now, which aid doesn't need to be notified in the middle of this crisis? And it's a very good uh, reminder by the commission to the member states and to us all, uh, various things, general measures, because there's no selectivity, de minimis aid, GB or general block exemption regulation doesn't need to be notified or because it's not aid, uh, sorry, it's not, it's it's exempted or suspension of taxes and social contributions generally they don't need to be notified staying with state aid and the covid crisis a huge sector which has been affected has been the transport sector now the covid 19 crisis is different than the financial crisis because the financial crisis the aid mainly went to banks and insurance companies here it's going to everybody as i was saying earlier now the transport sector has been particularly badly affected and there are a number of measures which have been adopted all soft law for air transport maritime for land and again for the payment of compensation to passengers for example say regulation 1177 of 2010 in the maritime area where passengers are entitled to compensation so uh, again the idea of vouchers and so on so trying to bring all this to, to, to some conclusion what are the final observations well first of all the commission has been extraordinarily helpful it has has benefited from the financial services crisis and it's now responding very well, very clearly. Remember, it was a new commission. A lot of the people at the top were only there for three or four months. Uh, you know, telephone number, email addresses, notification templates. For the most part, member states have moved uh, to use English. You'll see those decisions which have been published have been adopted really, really quickly. The commission has given a lot of guidance. There's informal com consolidated versions. It's all available available on the Commission's website, and the speed of decision making. Now, an American poet once said, when you're skating across thin ice, speed is your best strategy. And when you think, for example, in the, um, the way it was back in February, if you remember February, just picked a case at random. Now, it was a case I had an involvement in, so it was interesting for me. But if you look at the 24th of February, it was the Timishwara Airport case. The funding was in 2007. Registration of the case was in 2010. The investigation opened in 2011. I had dark hair then. In fact, I had hair then. The case was cleared in 2020, nine years. I could have even got myself through Trinity in that time. I may have failed every exam, but I'd have got there eventually. Three weeks later, 12th of March, Denmark makes a notification in COVID-19. It's cleared in 24 hours. Nine years in February, 24 hours in March. So I'm not saying nine years is typical, but when you think about the way the court, uh, and for example, the general court, for example, in Duferco said that the commission, you know, needs to do things carefully and so on. Um, this is the speed. And when you look, for example, these decisions, they're made in wartime, but some of them will be judicially reviewed in peacetime. If you take maybe a case about Lufthansa, where, you know, the chief executive says, oh, we need, we're getting more aid than we need. That's not how state aid is meant to work. Will they meet the standards of review? 
you look at speed, you look at the Irish cases, AIB, five years, Bank of Ireland, we thought we were on speed and fueled by Red Bull getting it done in 16 months. If you look at these Irish COVID-19 cases, you're looking at four days and five days and five days. Now, it is necessary. That's the nature of these things. Um, would the Lufthansa case survive? You know, look at the criteria that's being used. Look at the Air France case. You know, oh, end domestic flights for environmental considerations. I thought this was Articles 107 to 109 of the Treaty on State Aid. Um, if you think about the allocation of slots at uh, um, Frankfurt Airport, um, could the Commission, they, they almost found no aid that they couldn't like. Uh, they've not objected to anything, but maybe that's the case. Maybe state aid and competition has finally met its, its match in COVID-19. There are some matters which are beyond price and beyond economics. Um, Brexit, if you notice uh, from the put up the pie chart. The UK has been notified and quietly and silently and getting approval. The use of soft law is extremely important in this area of communications and that's something to be, I think, when this is over, we've really got to think about the use of soft law by the Commission in these communications. It is making up the rules, not in a pejorative sense, but it is making up the rules because it needs to, and there ought to be some period of review by which then it would be crystallised into something hard and soft. EU state aid law, more than public procurement, my colleague, uh, an expert, Anne-Marie Kern, put it very eloquently when she said the virus was novel, but the public procurement rules were not novel as in the sense that the issues public procurement was designed to cope with. State aid has been changed considerably. The minimus rules and so on have ha all had to be changed. It's battered and bruised that you can have so much aid, trillions of aid in the space of a few months. And that's the point. And this is the last slide, this is the last point I want to, to convey, that yes, state aid probably will recover, but no one, no one should blame the European Commission, no one should blame the fire brigade for coming so quickly to all the houses were on fire. They, even those houses which didn't need the fire brigade, coordination was very difficult, that was almost impossible, and for that reason, we now have a huge body of law a huge body of decisions, a huge amount of state aid. And I think the challenge here is that the lockdown was easy. It's the cranking up that will be difficult. It will be getting states off the sugar rush of state aid. That's going to be the challenging thing. So Dermot, I hope that's given you a little bit of an overview of state aid and the COVID-19 crisis. Thank you, Vincent. Um, that was a very useful uh, combination of information. For those of you who perhaps only um, dabble in state aid matters, there is a, a newsletter that you can sign up for free on the European Commission uh, website that sends you out every week the decisions taken in state aid. And it's a source of real information, which gives a snapshot of the level of aid that's been uh, granted in different states. Uh, Vincent, you've kindly put that all together in tables. It shows really where the talk stops and the money starts. And as you said, Vincent, some countries are relatively small beer compared to others. Very interesting indeed that most of this is coming under the temporary framework. Uh, for those of you listening in who may have questions, the questions will be fielded at the end, but please do feel free to write in your questions as they occur to you. They are listed here. This uh, webinar is being recorded for the purposes of later uh, posting on the Law School website and on the Facebook page. But the questions as such simply come in by text, as you probably know, and we will read out some of them at the conclusion. The next speaker then is uh, Kate McKenna, an alumnus of this uh, Law School and a partner in the EU Competition and Regulatory Law Group of Matheson. Again, I think known to uh, most of you, if not all of you. Kate, whilst uh, being in the EU competition area, is quite general in that area, uh, as well as having expertise in uh, specific areas. And today she will talk primarily about enforcement. Kate. Good afternoon, everybody. Delighted to be here. Um, well, I'm going to start off where Vincent ended um, and look at competition law and ask the question, has competition law been battered and bruised by COVID-19 in the same way as state aid? And I would suggest that the answer is not yet. Um, and the, 
the way in which COVID is shaping competition law is less front-loaded and less clear at the moment. Um, and that what we might do today is a bit of future gazing in terms of what might happen and what are the features um, of the current economic crisis um, and political landscape that might shape the future of competition law. So before we future gaze, we may just take a moment to look at history's lessons here. And I do this in very broad, general terms. So I think it's fair to say that there's some empirical evidence to show that competition law can take a backseat to other policy considerations in times of economic crisis and national anxiety. And the objectives of competition law can be subordinated to other stability concerns. So the question I think to pose is, is competition law, and in particular competition law enforcement, a political luxury good only to be consumed in times of prosperity? And you know, what is the basis for that concern? And I'm going to just very quickly look back to the very beginning of competition law and the 1890 Sherman Act in and the States. And there is a large body of literature written around um, how the economic depression of the panic of 1893 in the States was seen to give rise to a competition law enforcement recession as well as an economic recession. And the picture of the railroads symbolizes the story, which is probably oversimplified at this stage, about how in times of recession, um, Mr. J.P. Morgan was allowed to consolidate hugely his holdings of railways. And that led to the creation of a dominant position in particular in the western part of the country. And it was not until a post-recession era that um, Roosevelt um, led the use of Sherman Act powers that had existed pre the recession to um, give way to the unwinding of that monopoly. And similar, um, similar pictures were seen in the um, United States during the economic depression of the 1930s, where again, there's empirical evidence to suggest that the recession would have been shorter and less severe had antitrust enforcement not taken a back seat. And to skip maybe to more recent times and ask the question of um, what about the 2018 crisis? What did the performance of competition law enforcement at that time tell us um, about the impact of a crisis on competition law? And I think that it's, it's fair to say that there was a less bleak picture in 2018 and potentially a new narrative about competition law holding its weight and um, continuing to be um, an active area um, of, of both public and private enforcement during a recession. And one really interesting point that there's some research on, um, in particular in, in, in Central Europe and in the States, is whether what we saw, very broadly speaking again, um, in the um, late part of the last century, in terms of the increase in private actors in competition law, so more private competition litigation, more private companies making complaints to regulators, whether that increase in private activity um, was um, a counterbalance because for reasons I'll go on to explain, um, private disputes and private activity in this space can be counter cyclical and um, can um, increase actually in times of recession. So moving, 
to what are the factors that matter. And what I'm going to talk about here is, is what can we expect future gazing in terms of factors arriving, arising from the COVID crisis that may change the shape of competition law. And I'm going to point to five factors in industry and then look at the picture from a regulatory perspective. The first factor is well known to all of you, which is um, that there is greater need for rivals to cooperate with each other in, in current times, both due to government restrictions arising from COVID and due to acute public needs for particular services. And I've given two quotes on this slide. The first is um, one of the, um, I suppose, the most significant um, pieces of um, new thinking coming out from European competition law is the statement given by the ECN in late March um, in relation to the policy on competition enforcement across Europe by national competition authorities during the crisis. And there was a white flag as such raised in relation to measures which are necessary to avoid a shortage of supply, um, but involve coordination between com competitors, which might usually be frowned upon. And um, I think the difficult question that we are all grappling with is um, what type of measures um, are covered by this? And is there a gray area where, per the quote from the Howard Smith paper case, um, good motives can lead to bad outcomes from a competition law perspective? In Ireland, um, we haven't seen um, decisions issued by the Irish competition regulator blessing various types of cooperation between competitors in the time of COVID. Um, but it's interesting to look at other, other jurisdictions where there has been a huge amount of individual review and approval of cooperation measures between competitors. And this slide illustrates what's happened in Australia. And it's very, I think, um, worthwhile to sort of look at the type of measures um, that have been approved in Australia and pose the question to ourselves as to, are these happening in Ireland? Are people taking a view um, that they are permissible without engaging with the regulator? Or are they engaging with the regulator on an informal basis? Or will we see um, investigations and regulators taking the same or different views in relation to the legitimacy of some of these measures with some of them, as you can maybe pick out a few, being um, obviously um, more directly related to the health crisis, such as coordination of the supply of medical supplies of ventilators, than others, such as um, cooperation between um, tenants and landlords in relation to the extent of rent relief to be granted um, to businesses in financial difficulty. So that is one to watch in the absence of decision-making in Ireland. The second factor from an industry perspective that I think is relevant and we should continue to monitor as it will shape competition law decision-making is the greater need that businesses face in an economic crisis to cooperate um, in order to raise their voice and be heard by government, in particular through trade associations. The two quotes on this slide illustrate um, the long-standing deep suspicion of competition regulators and others to trade association activities. And while as yet in Ireland we haven't um, seen the Irish competition regulator um, raise alarm at a particular trade association activity in the context of COVID, I think that is one to watch. The third feature which I want to identify as likely to shape the law is the greater likelihood of commercial contract disputes 
in times of economic um, recession. And the point to be made here is that, of course, um, as you're familiar with the competition law, you realize that in a lot of supply contracts, there are restraints um, on people's activities, exclusivity provisions and the like, which come into focus in a situation where people are not performing contracts or are seeking to escape their um, commercial obligations under contracts. And therefore, we can see um, more decision making on um, the competition um, law legitimacy um, of such restrictions in a crisis situation. And just to point you, um, in the absence of detailed statistics on the type of cases launched in Irish courts, unfortunately, I um, have to look at the UK, and I thought it was really interesting to see that in the financial crisis of 2008-2009, it was observed in the English High Court that there was um, an increase of over 40% in the commercial contract dispute cases which were being initiated as compared to pre-financial crisis times. So again, this is a slow burn. It takes time for these cases to come to the courts and for competition law points to arise from them in particular um, where the courts are operating as they are currently. But I think we can expect to see um, some change in this area. Penultimate fi um, factor um, that I want to identify is um, one which um, is often talked about, which is mega mergers in, in an economic um, recession. Um, can we expect um, there to be less mergers, but more difficult mergers in terms of higher market shares and greater aggregation um, of market power um, in the coming years? I think the answer to that is yes. Um, I refer on this slide to sort of a prediction in the last couple of days of consolidation in the financial services sector. And looking back at the last recession, referring to two cases um, which um, um, caused a lot of concern in the last financial crisis. And the Irish case, which I'll mention again, was a 2008 um, Kerry Brio merger, which the authority attempted to block. And the UK case is Lloyd's H. Boss. And I mention this um, because it was um, a situation where competition law expressly and transparently took a backseat to other policy considerations in terms of the UK using um, financial stability um, objectives and related powers to wave through a merger which raised competition concerns um, leading in particular to market shares over 50% in the Scottish um, personal banking markets. The last factor in terms of an industry condition to watch for competition implications coming out of is the greater opportunity um, for a situation like this to lead to organic growth and market power and creation of dominant positions which may be abused. And uh, the, again, the two quotes symbolize you know, both sides of the coin here. The ECN statement that I referred to earlier includes a stern warning that authorities will be vigilant in um, watching companies who have grown significant market power and, and ensuring that that power is not abused. And the second um, quote from um, an American academic is about the point that, um, of course, um, restrictions like the COVID-19 restrictions um, are an opportunity um, to create monopoly positions which are sought to be avoided by other areas of competition law. So leaving behind those five factors which may shape the future of competition law um, in the COVID context, I think I want to just pause finally and look at this from the regulator's perspective. Um, and the question to pose is, 
how do um, we expect the Irish competition regulators and others to perform in terms of um, case throughput and outcomes in um, a crisis situation such as this? And I think the two factors which are relevant in particular here are number one, resource constraints that historically and at times like this where the public budget is under constrained authorities like the Irish CCPC, which are already significantly um, smaller than their European peers, tend to be short on resources and that can have a knock-on impact on activity. And the second point, which is new for Ireland, um, having merged its competition and consumer law regulators into one since the last financial crisis is how is the tug of war going to play out between the consumer law objectives and the competition law objectives of the Irish regulator because of course huge political pressure as you can see from the um, recent program for government that was published is being put currently on vulnerable consumers and consumer law enforcement and if there is a finite amount of regulatory resource will this have a knock-on adverse impact on the level of competition law enforcement in Ireland and um, in terms of answering that question I thought I would just leave you with a compare and contrast in terms of level of activity by the Irish competition regulator and I picked um, 2018 as a recession year and I compared it against 2017. I would have preferred to compare it against a more recent year but um, the annual reports of the competition regulator don't show some of the statistics um, for recent years. So just a couple of takeaways from this. Um, I think in answer to the first question I posed of whether we should expect a competition law enforcement recession with an economic recession, what the statistics show is that there was a lot of investigation and complaint activity um, with the Irish competition regulator during the last financial crisis. If you compare the number of um, dawn raids, um, exercises and witness summonses, you will see that there were higher levels of activity um, in 2018 that during more prosperous times, although there may be other factors in relation to that point. And the really striking number I felt was the number of complaint cases. And this goes back to the point I made about private enforcement and private activity um, being a counterbalance. And it shows that during um, an economic recession, the amount of um, competition cases which are opened tends to be higher, although in terms of outcomes, i.e. where the regulator ultimately obtains a remedy that it announces, um, unfortunately, it would appear that there was a lot of case opening and not a lot of case closure with remedies. Um, Kate, uh, thank you very much for that indeed. Uh, it, it's a very interesting point, and for, for many of us, of course, quite an optimistic point in a way that at least enforcement and competition activity won't um, uh, cease in light of the current crisis. And interesting indeed that you see it as being, and Andrew really backed it up, that it is a counter cyclical uh, reaction, really, that private enforcement increases after a time of crisis. And of course, this time around, there will be both the uh, implementation of the uh, damages directive in competition law matters and there will be the, uh, the recent directive 1 of 2019 which has also been brought into force so uh, we may well see an upswing in private enforcement. Uh, the next speaker then is Claire uh, Graydon, I think fair to say uh, Claire a genuine specialist in the field of public procurement Claire was uh, educated in law both in England and in Ireland and in business in Ireland and now practices I think fairly exclusively in the field of public procurement. Claire, to you. Great, thank you very much, Dermot. Um, one second here to share these. 
Okay, so um, I know we have a, a fair mix of people here today. And um, so just to give you a very quick introduction to what I'm going to be speaking about today, it, it is public procurement, and this is essentially the process by which government departments um, or local authorities purchase works, goods and services. It is, it is regulated by the Public Authority Contracts Act 2016. So when I am referring to regulations, um, that is what I'm referring to. So I'm going to go through a snapshot of government guidance that we got um, starting in March when COVID really hit um, and the guidance that we got from the Office of Government Procurement and the Capital Works Management Framework and essentially what the regulations allowed and, and as Vincent said, um, procurement was designed to deal with situations like this. So we very much already had a framework in place that was reactive and allowed contracting authorities to deal with COVID-19. So, one of, one of the questions we had in a practical sense um, from contracting authorities were, what do we do when the tenders are at different stages? And there were live tenders, there were tenders up on e-tenders. Um, what can we do in that scenario? Um, what we seen was that quite a lot of contracting authorities pulled the documents from e-tenders and amended them, um, especially for those competitions, obviously, that were affected by COVID-19. Um, a, a lot of construction projects in particular where pricing documents were taken and redrafted to allow for the new health and safety measures that were going to have to be implemented and things like the re return to work safety protocol etc and so it was fairly okay for live tenders and um, we did also see tenders post submission but pre-evaluation where the same thing happened so tenders may have been submitted but the evaluation hadn't taken place yet and contracting authorities went out to tenders and said look this change has happened since you tendered your price are you happy to stand over your tenured price? Do you want to withdraw it? This is the changes. This is what you're going to have to do on the project. And um, you have an opportunity now to reprice it. Do you want to do that? And the majority of people did, did stand over their prices. Um, a decision was made to award the contract, but it, it was pre-contract. So essentially the Dear John letters had gone out. Um, in tender A knew they were successful um, and all the other tenders had been advised they were not. Um, but the contract, there was no pen to paper, the contract hadn't been entered into yet. And there were a number of queries about whether um, contracting authorities could negotiate with tenders at that time in that, um, in, in that area. Uh, and the answer is, is was no. Um, the only procedure that you can negotiate post tender submission was a competitive procedure with negotiation. So unfortunately, once contracting authorities um, had made the decision to award um, or were in contract, any changes that happened were then dealt with under the contract. And we'll have a look in particular at the PwC, um, in short, on, on how that really failed to deal with the implications that it had on construction projects. So we'll have a quick look at, at the OGP um, guidelines that we got. The OGP guidelines really just refreshed people um, and, and gave them um, clarity as to what the regulations allowed them to do. Um, the, the first procedure and probably the procedure that was used mostly throughout COVID um, was Regulation 32. So this allowed contracting authorities to make direct awards um, where there was a case of extreme urgency. So if you have a look on OGU, you'll see a lot of contract awards now this is for things like PPE, um, courier services, testing services. So it's that type of thing where the contracting authority was able to go directly to a provider and say, this is what we need, give us a price for that. Um, so essentially, this goes against the grain of, of public procurement. And there are only specific circumstances in which you can use this. And one of those are um, where you can prove extreme urgency that was not attributable to the contracting authority and that was brought about by unforeseeable events and where the time limits, you can't abide by the time limits for, for other procedures. Um, so if it fit right in really with um, the, the COVID crisis. The next thing um, contracting authorities could do was use accelerated time sales for the, the standard procedures. So essentially, if you couldn't fulfill that four stage test to use um, Regulation 32, so extreme urgency, attribu not attributable to the contracting authority, unforeseeable events, etc., you could use accelerated time scales. So for the open procedure, um, it's usually 30 days from when you issue the tender to when it's, it's, it's submitted. That was reduced to 15 days. And there was also a reduction on, on restricted procedure and competitive procedure at negotiation as well. So it, it, it considerably 
co contracting parties were able to considerably um, lessen the time that it took to run a procurement procedure, essentially. The use of the light touch regime, um, again, contracting parties were refreshed as to what this is. This is where there, there's limited cross-border interest and the directive notes, Annex 14 of the directive notes, a number of services where the commission deemed that there's limited cross-border interest. So it's things like postal services, prison services, and the one that was pertinent here was, was health services. So the provision of nursing staff and things like that. So up to 750,000, if you needed a contract for up to that value, it, it fell under the light touch regime and it really, really flexible. You weren't, you, you had to advertise it, but then it was up to you what sort of procedure you used, a hybrid procedure, one that you've made up yourself, and um, how you evaluated it was completely up to you. And um, contracts could be awarded a lot quicker. You chose the turnaround time as well. So light touch regimes were used for some essential services. And then the, the fourth um, thing was extending or modifying a contract during its term under Regulation 72. So this was used, for instance, where um, procurement staff, there's, there's always limited procurement staff and contracting authorities in-house. And where those staff were tied up with procuring urgent requirements or maybe were unavailable, sick, whatever the case may be, Contracting authorities look to this regulation to extend current contracts or modify current contracts. So there are a number of scenarios under the regulations that allow you to modify contracts under Regulation 72. And um, specifically um, here, um, one of those is, is where the need for modification was brought about by circumstances which a diligent contractor could not have foreseen and does not alter the overall nature of the contract. So it really a fit right into a lot of scenarios that would have been encountered um, during COVID. It is important to keep in mind that the modification that you, you make under Regulation 72 or you rely on, um, it cannot be more than 50% of the contract value. Um, if it's more than 50% of the contract value, you're into termination territory. Okay, we'll just have a quick look now at the CWMF guidance that we got. Um, CWMF guidance really relates to construction related services and um, construction works. So on, on the 8th of May 2020, um, we got an update to, to the note on procurement and contractual matters associated with the COVID-19 response measures. And it advised um, contracting authorities to extend the deadline by at least six weeks from the initial note um, issued on the 14th of April. And um, again, you know, that, that was imperative for the construction, construction sector. People, contractors that were pricing construction projects didn't know what they were getting themselves into, didn't know how long the delay was going to take, didn't know what the health and safety measures that were going to be imposed were going to entail, and therefore were very uncertain on price and um, on things like that. So recommendation that procurements were not concluded until there was great and, uh, greater certainty. Now, I have planned on going into this in a little bit more detail, um, but it was actually replaced last night and um, yesterday evening, that guidance that was replaced. Um, so that's just thoughts law. Um, previous to this, on the 19th of March, I just want to point out something because we did kind of say we would look to the future um, and what we think may cause issues going forward. Um, the CWMF issued a note on the 19th of March and advised employers, um, it was important to ensure that oversight, supervision, and inspection roles continue, and um, where this is not possible, um, or for any reason works cannot be executed in compliance with health and safety regulations, it may be necessary to, clo to close the site. And if that arises, the EOR should direct the contractor to suspend the work under clause 9.2. So, so there was a firm indication that, look, if, if your supervision staff aren't able to attend site, if they're not available, if they're sick, and um, if they're worried about going to site, you shouldn't instruct to close that site down. It's the employer's obligation to ensure that health and safety is adhered to. So at that stage, um, so that did happen on a lot of sites and, and contractors shut up shop and they thought at that stage, um, you know, this is going to be fine. If, in, if an instruction comes to close the site, we are, we're entitled to recover for time and money under 1K15 of the public works contracts. So it was all fine. Um, and then another note came out on the 14th of April, which confirmed that the public works contracts do not provide an entitlement um, to the contractor to recover costs associated with the delay arising from site closure in the current circumstances. So that was fairly contrary to what had been said before, 
and contrary to contractors on a, a lot of people's understanding of the public works contract. So where a site had been instructed to close, um, it, contractors were not entitled to claim. Now there was an ex gracia payment, um, we, the government talked about giving contractors an ex gracia payment, but the calculation as to how they arrived at the value of that related back to their preliminaries, how they priced their overheads and things like that. And contractors as a rule of thumb will generally price them very, very low um, to be more competitive. So it was not favorable for a lot of contractors. And um, we will see, I'd say a lot of um, disputes falling out the back of that, where the contractual entitlement is there. However, the government has issued guidance saying otherwise. Um, unfortunately, we won't see it in the courts because the public works contracts um, are any dispute is ultimately decided by arbitration. But um, I'm sure we'll hear um, utterances um, as to what happens with them. But we do know there are a number of live disputes in relation to that. Um, I think I'll wrap up there. I know we've gone over a little bit. So um, back to you, David. Well, thank you very much, um, Claire. And thanks for those updates, which I think um, several of us may have missed that the, the, the timelines and so on have been extended and are being extended and kept under review. Um, we have a, a couple of questions, certainly. I might start immediately by one raised by Richard Horan. And uh, Richard pitches up three um, d different points. Yeah, on the one hand, the Commission's willingness to uh, approve state aid uh, under the temporary framework. Secondly, member states uh, themselves have been uh, engaging in uh, rhetoric, some more than others, about industrial policy and how does this twin. And then thirdly, the somewhat collateral issue of the European Commission's white paper on the regulation of foreign subsidies. This came out, as um, some of us will know, on the 17th of June. It's something of, an, of a new departure, uh, quite a curious departure, the Commission identified a supposed gap in the regulation of competition because of course competition does control foreign goods and services but doesn't directly immediately control uh, foreign capital. And so it does point towards a future regulation of foreign capital, uh, curiously at a time where there's a very large increase in debt where one might think that foreign capital would be welcome and perhaps is somewhat indicative of a European industrial policy indeed. So this is the question. How do these three things um, uh, fit together? Vincent, I, I, I fear this may be targeted primarily uh, at yourself, but Kate, I, I suspect, and Claire also, if you have uh, a contribution, please do. Well, if Kate and Claire want to go first, more than happy, that would suit, and then I'll happily come in at the end if that would suit, Dermot. I might make it back. I might make a comment to kick off with. I think that the, the regulation of foreign subsidies is a really interesting development and you know, part of, I suppose, a, a protectionist theme that you can see in, in times of national anxiety like this. And what I would just say from an Irish perspective is in the same space, I think what I'm more interested in is what's going to happen with Irish incorporation of the foreign direct investment regulation um, towards the end of this year, where we have to make a decision ourselves in relation to what to do about um, introducing a regime which um, might act like another merger control regime in Ireland for acquisitions um, by non-EU buyers. Very good. Uh, uh, absolutely. Um, I think it's a really challenging question Richard has raised. Um, first of all, you know, the, the, the net question I suppose is how temporary will the uh, temporary framework be? And the answer is not temporary at all. Um, if you think about it this way, during the financial crisis, we had a temporary framework for state aid in the financial services sector back in 2008. And then if you look at the 12th of June of this year, we have the 16th prolongation of the Irish Credit Union state aid regime. So you and the, the Second Amendment to the uh, temporary framework and state aid had references to the restructuring communications back from 2008. So is it going to be temporary? No, 
Secondly, the question is very challenging and very interesting because it raised that question about industrial policy. Uh, and when the Commission blocked on the 6th of February 2019 the Siemens Alstom transaction, because it didn't want to support the national champions idea. It felt that there was a significant impediment of effective competition. What it's done now is it's not so much protecting national champions, though you might say that with Lufthansa and Air France. It's actually trying to avoid national casualties. Uh, and the third point I'd say would be is that state aid is always the most political of all areas of competition law. So I think that the effects will be there as a regime. The effects will be there economically, and today's Financial Times, the long read, uh, is really good on, on this point about the effect in Germany and uh, taking a very casual, flimsy remark. But um, you know the way economists look, for example, if you want to see if there's a recession coming, um, there's a drop in the amount of underwear people buy, there's a drop in the amount of dry cleaning they get done. And if you want to see a boom coming, you look at restaurant reservations, and restaurant reservations in Germany are going way up. So my point is that I think the long-term effects will be there of, of, of what's there. Um, I think the subsidies paper of the 17th of June is almost a different topic. Um, it is a form of foreign control. Uh, Canada has it, Australia has it, and so on. Uh, and it is a case of more protection. So what I'd like to see at the end of it is a more communitaire European Union structure, but I think what you will find is much more of a protectionist type structure, um, and this is putting the, the bits in place. One of the lessons out of the financial crisis was when, you know, in the 92 program, you compelled banks or encouraged banks to uh, coordinate and form a single market. 2008, we forced them to sell things, and it was non-EU entities largely bought them, because the EU entities couldn't buy them because they were constrained and the same thing is happening now so I think we'll see a little bit more protectionism uh, a little bit more of communitaire type approach uh, but um, the sugar rush as I called it earlier of state aid that's going to be a really difficult habit to kick. Well, th th thank you to you both I think we have um, and I I'd say Stephen Britton may be listening to this with interest if this white paper may be the subject of a of a future ICEL conference as things develop. I think we have time for just for one uh, further quick uh, question. Claire, this is probably targeted primarily at you, but Kate, indeed, and perhaps Vincent, if you have anything to add. It's a question of whether you foresee any issues with the supply chains generally, something which everyone is being concerned with, and perhaps in particular with the construction industry with which you're most familiar. Um, I suppose for us and from liaison with our clients at the moment, um, we haven't seen an issue with the supply chains. I think that very much relates um, to the fact that there was that lag for the two and a half months that construction sites were closed. So that material was still sitting there and not being used during that time. Um, you know Whether it can be replenished as quickly as it needs to, I think we'll find out um, in the next few months. But for now, um, we haven't seen any any big issues in the supply chain thus far. And where there has been an issue, um, we, the contracts have been changed to use alternative materials, etc. That you know that they can source easier. Well, then it remains for me just to thank, firstly, on behalf of all the uh, participants, the uh, speakers, Kate McKenna from. Uh, Matheson's Claire Graydon and Vincent Parr and uh, also to Stephen Britton for organizing this and in the background Sean O'Brien for his um, technical assistance. Uh, thanks to you all. Thank you. Well, thank you. Bye-bye.